Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, July 11th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, report the majority of Americans want Hillary charged for the email scandal. Then, what role has social media played in reaction to recent tragedies? After that, should they change the name from self-driving to self-crashing cars? And the Dallas police chief says that cops are requested to do too much in the community. That's next. We're asking cops to do too much in this country. We are. We're just asking us to do too much. Every societal failure, we put it off on the cops to solve. Not enough mental health funding. Let the cop handle not enough drug addiction funding. Let's give it to the cops. As we get ever closer to a race war in this country, we need to step back and look at how we can solve this problem rather than continuing to point fingers at each other. Take a look at this story from the Washington Post. It's a good example of how two sides can misinterpret the data, okay? The Washington Post asks, aren't more white people than black people killed by the police? And they say yes, but no. And then they go on to point out the statistics. Since January 2015, 732 white people have been killed by police, 381 were, uh, black people were killed by police. But then they go on to talk about how if you look at it as a percentage, you have two and a half times more blacks killed than white. Why don't we look at it this way? Why don't we say, what can we do to stop 1,100 people from being killed unnecessarily by the police? And I'm not saying all these uh, shootings were unnecessary. But we do have a lot of unnecessary shootings. How do we get control of that? We aren't going to get control of it if we try to continually point the blame at the other side, if we try to use this to promote a racialist agenda, which is what Obama and his cronies have been doing for the last 50 years. As I pointed out on Friday, going back to Bill Ayers and the SDS, the idea of white privilege, the idea that they could use a division between blacks and whites to create their socialist revolution. And I have to say that black people are being betrayed by the Black Lives Matter because they're focusing on the racial aspect of this. We need to stop the excessive use of force. And if you're a minority, why would you tell the majority that it's not their problem? And that's essentially what they're doing. They're saying this is simply a problem of the black community. Shut up, it's not your problem. They tell white people that if you have violence and retaliation, uh, when the police react out of fear, or maybe out of racism. I'm sure there's some racism there. There's a lot of fear. The shooting that was done by the individual in Dallas, that was clearly racist. Okay, so we need to understand where this is going, and we need to look at what we can do to pull this together. Meanwhile, we've got the solution that is being offered by Obama and the people who want a revolution in this country saying we have to centralize control of our police force. Understand that the worst thing we can do in this country is to continually centralize power in Washington. You should understand that in multiple ways by now. But if you try to centralize this kind of power, that is the worst kind of centralization. We have the Dallas police chief saying, we're asking cops to do too much. No, the reality is we're asking government to do too much. This is what he had to say. This is Dallas police chief David Brown at a press conference today saying, every societal failure, we put it off on the cops to solve whether it is mental health or drug addiction or loose dogs or failing schools, we expect the cops to solve the problem. No, you see, what they're doing is the cops are actually the vehicle of government. They're where the rubber meets the road. But we have to ask, who is driving these problems and offering us a solution where government is always a solution? I mean, when we look at the situation like drug addiction, as we pointed out many times, it should not be a law enforcement issue. We should not have to have cops in the schools. They weren't in the schools when I was in school. We don't have to have the police involved here. We don't have to have force as a solution to every problem, government force. But that's what they continue to offer us. And, but then he goes on with this non sequitur. Even when he says uh, policing was never meant to solve all these problems, then later on he says, be part of the solution. Become a police officer. We're hiring. Get off the protest line and put in an application. We'll help you to resolve some of the problems you're protesting about. No, he continues to sell the idea that the government then can solve all these problems. So we're back where we started from. But one of the most troubling things to me that has come out of this is the use of a militarized robot for the first time. And of course, 
We see the article that was linked on a Drudge Report from a Defense One saying military robotics makers see a future for the armed police robots, okay? And they see absolutely no problem with it, although we have people who are ethicists who do see a problem with this. If we go back and we look at the initial reports of this, uh, The Verge talked to someone who had seen uh, robots used this way in Iraq as part of a war. And we have to understand, this is not about proposing that we're going to militarize the police. The police have been militarized for a very long time, fighting a war on drugs, as I mentioned before. It's an addiction problem. It is not a use of force problem. But they have created a war on drugs, which is a war against our people in this country, specifically against the black people, targeting them more than any other community, bringing drugs into their country, just as we've seen with the crack cocaine epidemic. It was a CIA move to put a crack cocaine epidemic into the black communities, and then they ramp up the war on drugs. Why? Because it is really about making money for the military industrial complex. It's about accruing even more power to the government because we continually ask them to solve the problems. Earlier today, the Drudge Report had this picture up about the uh, militarized robot and Matt Drudge tweeted out, he said, what race is a police robot killer? And I tweeted back and I said, well, it's an arms race is what it is. It's really like Ed 209. Remember the uh, Ed 209 robot from RoboCop? Please put down your weapon. You have 20 seconds to comply. You now have 15 seconds to comply. You are in direct violation of Penal Code 113, Section 9. You now have 5 seconds to comply. Four. Now what you saw there with Ed 209 was an autonomous killer robot. And what we had happen in Dallas was a robot under the control of the police. And they decided that they would not subdue the subject with gas, but that they would kill him with a bomb. But understand that the days of autonomous killer robots are coming very quickly. Earlier in the week, we had a story on Drudge Report about how killer robots are being programmed to hunt down prey as a group. Okay, this, this, there's a story right there, and they say, one day this could be a very important skill for robots across the world. Because you understand, when we have these DARPA challenges with the robots, they tell us, well, we need to be able to have these robots go in dangerous places like Fukushima where they can shut it down. That's not what they're for. And they are not going to use robots to hunt down antelope. They're going to use them to hunt down people. Let's look at where this is really headed. We've got a Story up on InfoWars today from the Ron Paul Institute in Dallas, the drone wars just came home. And they point out after hours of what police claimed were fruitless negotiations with Johnson, a weaponized robot was sent to where he was hiding and blown up, taking him along with it. And they have a tweet there from Peter Van Buren who said, we have the first law enforcement use of drones, albeit with wheels and not wings, to kill someone without trial in America. And he goes on to say, police claim that continuing negotiations was pointless and attempting to capture him would have put officers at risk, okay? Now, understand where this is going to go. When we say that we're going to be able to use lethal force against people who are suspects. They point out in here, the person who you saw the picture floating around social media for quite some time, the black man with a goatee that was in camo, his name was Mark Hughes. And they say he was wrongly identified by Dallas police as a suspect in the shooting. Police tweeted photos of him marching with protesters, openly carrying a rifle, as is permitted in Texas. Police claim he was involved in the shooting. He was a suspect, just like Johnson was a suspect. During questioning, they told Hughes that they had a video of him shooting people, which was a lie. What if police had sent the drone to take out Mark Hughes? What will happen in the future to a future Mark Hughes, who was falsely accused by police of being involved in the shooting? Will we come to accept murder without trial? And I would suggest to you that is a slippery slope. And I think that is one of the most disturbing things that has come out of this event. It's one of the reasons why we have to stop pushing this forward, fighting between each other as black and white, and understand where the real danger, where the real problem lies. We have to get control of the police. That control has to be local, not federal, not distant from us. We have to understand that. Now, on RT, they point out uh, that the Dallas sniper shootings were put on the spotlight in open carry gun laws here in Texas. They say that both the mayor and the police chief mocked the idea that we have open carry here in Texas. 
This is what the police chief said. He said, it doesn't make sense to us, but that's their right in Texas. That's police chief Brown. He said, for our officers, they were suspects, and I support that belief. He said, they are suspects until we eliminate that, or in the future, until they eliminate them. That's the true danger. That's where we're headed with this militarization of the police. Think about SWAT teams, how we now have about 80,000 SWAT raids a year in this country because of the war on drugs. But of course, it's going to get much worse. And in many of those cases, innocent people are injured or killed when they go to the wrong location. People like to call in SWAT raids as a joke or call it in on their enemies. And we've had similar situations where people call in and say, I've got somebody here with a gun and the police show up and start shooting immediately. Like that young man in Ohio who was killed. As you can see, the, the police officer jumping out of the car, immediately shooting this young man who was simply playing with a BB gun. We have to understand what the real problem is, and we're not going to go down this road of a federalized, militarized police. We have to understand that and push back against that. Meanwhile, we look at Hillary Clinton, we see that a majority now disapprove of her not being charged. This is a poll done by ABC News and Washington Post. Now, remember, these are the same people that a couple of weeks ago put out a poll showing Hillary Clinton winning by 12 points over Donald Trump. And then if you look at the details, <laughs> you see that uh, they had 12% more Democrats than they did Republicans. But in this poll, they say 56% disapprove of the fact that the FBI director recommended not to charge Clinton, while only 35% did approve. And when I look at this, uh, I hope that is the case this time. I hope they have gone through and heavily skewed this towards Democrats who are so blindly loyal to party that they can't see the principle involved. Because I have a hard time believing that only 56% of the people would look at this situation as he laid it out. Look at the felonies that he listed there. Look at the fact that he laid out how extremely careless and grossly negligent, he didn't use the word grossly negligent, but he did say it was extremely careless and it's the same thing. And then say he's not going to charge us after saying that the uh, religion of the state national security was violated in the worst way. Meanwhile, we see that Hillary Clinton's uh, aides may lose their security clearance. Who are they going to throw under the bus in order to save Hillary Clinton? They're saying pressure is growing on the State Department to revoke the security clearances of several of Hillary's closest aides. The move could force her to make an uncomfortable choice to either abandon longtime advisors or face another political maelstrom by overriding White House security agency. Now, of course, they did that once before with uh, Sandy Berger. And interestingly enough, as we pointed out last week, both Loretta Lynch and Comey were part of that process in making sure that Sandy Berger, as I call him, Sandy Burglar, who went in the National Archives, stuffed incriminating documents into his pants took them out and destroyed them, of course, somebody who had worked for the Clintons and the security apparatus that they had at the time. He got away with nothing, okay? They had no punishment for Sandy the burglar. Speaker Paul Ryan has demanded that Clinton be denied clearance to receive national security briefings, usually given to presidential nominees to prepare them for taking over the nation's highest office. Others called out Clinton's aides by name, demanding that any active privileges they may hold be immediately revoked. Isn't this interesting? First time that we've had a situation where the security violations of the person running for president, one of the two people likely to become president, has so grossly violated all the national security regimes that uh, they're calling for her security clearance to be revoked. And it should be. And it was for Bill Clinton's director of CIA after he did exactly the same thing that Hillary Clinton did. John Deutsch had his security clearance revoked. Now, in other news, we have a third Tesla crash that happened over the weekend. Uh, this is the third time we've had autopilot involved in a crash. This was in Montana. They say this is an area where they did not have a center line. That is a condition that is supposed to be there for Tesla's so-called autopilot. But then the question is, did it disengage on the fly? As I point out in Road and Track, did it disengage on the fly due to lack of visual data? It's also possible the driver wasn't paying attention when the car disengaged, wasn't able to react quickly enough. See, that's the issue. What do you do when it can't find its way and it just gives up? Do you have enough time to wake up from your nap, to stop watching the movie that you're watching, to stop uh, tweeting on Twitter before you crash and go off the road? Perhaps not. Meanwhile, we see the SEC is now investigating Tesla 
for possible breaches of securities laws. This is an agency that evidently they don't have as cozy a relationship with as they do with the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration. The SEC is investigating whether or not Tesla breached security laws by failing to disclose a fatal crash in May. You say, wait a minute, May? We just heard out about that a week or two ago. Yeah, that's because they kept it hidden for two months. They didn't inform NHTSA until nine days after the crash, okay? But that uh, was nothing compared to what they did to the rest of the country. If you look at the timeline, you will see May 4th, Tesla announced their first quarter results, okay? The fact that, oh, this is good news. Then three days later was the accident, the fatal accident for Joshua Brown. That was not made public. That was not made public for 54 days. They didn't tell NHTSA about it for another nine days. Meanwhile, while all this was going on, Goldman Sachs upgraded Tesla stock to a buy on May 18th. Then on May 18th and 19th, Tesla announced that it was going to sell $1.5 billion in stock. Then they cut their price on June 9th uh, of the Model S by $10,000. And that was when NHTSA disclosed that they were investigating consumer complaints of suspension failures on the Model S. But most amazingly, Tesla made it a requirement of those who are getting their warranty work on that done to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So here we are, we're in June 9th, and they continue to uh, make stock deals and don't reveal this until June 30th. That's when the public finds out about it. That is the kind of, they're, they're given the kinds of pass by NHTSA that we have seen Hillary Clinton given by the FBI. That's what happens with crony capitalism and with regulatory capture. Stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about developments with Brexit. There's a new prime minister. Will she move to press on with Brexit or will they say we're not going to do it? In a surprise move today, British Prime Minister David Cameron announced that he'll be stepping down by Wednesday and turning over the reins to someone else. Now, he announced immediately after Brexit that he would be stepping down because he had championed Brexit. Meanwhile, within his own conservative party, the power uh, the party that is in power, there were several people who were competing for leadership. Boris Johnson was the obvious choice, but he took himself out of the running not long after Brexit happened. Then Michael Gove was also uh, in the running. He had also supported leaving. He took himself out. Then it was down to two women. Now, one of those women who also supported Brexit just took herself out of the race. That means that there's only one person who is running, and that's Theresa May, who opposed Brexit until they won. And then she said she was all in favor of it, presumably, so she could become uh, the leader of the Conservative Party. We'll see how this works out. But the announcement came just hours after her only rival in the race, the energy minister, unexpectedly abandoned her campaign and said the country could not afford a drawn out political contest needed to launch quickly into the complicated bargaining with the European Union over the split. Now, they say the move will likely accelerate the pressure on Britain to exit the EU. European leaders have said that Britain must act quickly as possible to get out. However, as I just pointed out, May campaigned against Brexit. She came back and said, today, Brexit means Brexit, and we are going to make a success of it. Well, we shall see if that's truly going to happen or if it is merely a head fake. She's already said that she's going to delay it to the end of the year. And David Cameron had talked about having new leadership that would handle Brexit that would file the required paperwork by some time in September. So now it looks like they're going to delay it even further. Meanwhile, there's an article we have at Infowars.com from Reuters. Brexit vote was not binding, so Parliament must decide, say, lawyers. Now, this is a large number of lawyers. More than 1,000 prominent British lawyers said that lawmakers should have a free vote in Parliament before any British leader takes a decision to trigger the formal EU divorce procedure by invoking Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. A separate group of lawyers, however, advise the British government that the Prime Minister does not need parliamentary approval to start the process. So what will it be? We've already had John Kerry, our Secretary of State, go over there and say, well, I don't think Brexit is really going to happen. What is the reasoning behind this? Well, the argument for parliamentary approval is that invoking Article 50 would be a violation of the authority of the EU. In other words, You've already lost your sovereignty, so shut up. You don't have anything to say about it. That's essentially what they're saying. They're saying that uh, also that parliament cannot, uh, that a parliamentary law cannot be revoked by a prime minister or by the people themselves. Very interesting. They said it is a, an advisory uh, result. 
the same sort of thing that we're seeing here in America as we head to the Republican convention. The GOP delegates are saying, well, all these primaries, we had the voters turn out and vote by the millions. That's simply an advisory. We will decide. And so that's what a lot of connected lawyers are now telling the British government. Now, if they want a reason why they made the right decision, take a look at this article that's up on Infowars.com from Bloomberg. EU banks need $166 billion, says a Deutsche Bank economist. Okay, he said Europe is extremely sick and must start dealing with the problems extremely quickly or there will be an accident. He said, I'm no doomsday prophet, I am a realist. And as part of this, we see Italian banks have been weighed down by 360 billion euros of bad loans, okay? And that only gets worse for them because Britain voted to leave the European Union. See, they were going to stick Britain with a great deal of this bill. And that's one of the reasons that the British public said that we wanted, they wanted to get out of the European Union. They need to remember that. He goes on to say, I do not expect a second financial crisis like 2008. He said the banks are much more stable today. They have more equity. What we face this time is a slow, long, downward spiral. Oh, really? We have another article at Infowars.com from David Stockman. Remember the economist who advised Ronald Reagan? He said, here we go again, a redo of August 2007. He said, nearly everywhere we see these giant financial bubbles are starting to burst. And again, he cites what's going on in Italy with the banks. He also talks about sudden trading suspensions by three UK commercial property funds. He says it all boils down to being a repeat of what we saw in 2007. As they were saying, countrywide was simply uh, the excesses of empire building and Bear Stearns mortgage funds were purportedly owing to a lapse in supervision. But we're heading there again. Okay, remember it was Standard & Poor's that said it's not a problem and gave AAA ratings to all these collateralized debts that these uh, banks had created. So now we see that the financial crisis in the EU, just as it was designed to do, is bringing Europe to the brink, along with open borders. Here's John Bowne with the report. As Obama and his United Nations directed stooges move to divide the United States and override the U.S. Constitution in order to federalize police under the strong cities network in an aggressive bid to foment martial law, Europe is reaching the boiling point. Paul Joseph Watson writes, the head of French police recently warned that the country is on the verge of a civil war that could be triggered by another mass sexual assault of women by migrants like the one that occurred in Cologne on New Year's Eve. Eve. Patrick Culver, who is the head of the Directorate General of Internal Security, told members of a French parliamentary commission, we are on the brink of civil war. Calver said that the situation in France is so potentially explosive that one more major Islamist terror attack or mass migrant sexual assault could lead to a massive right-wing backlash. Calver says, this confrontation, I think, will take place. Even one or two attacks and it will happen. It therefore behooves us to anticipate and block all these groups. Hundreds of German women were sexually abused during a series of attacks in Cologne on December 31st, a situation that eyewitnesses described as being akin to a war zone. Most of the culprits, who were largely comprised of Arab and North African asylum seekers and immigrants, were never charged for the outrage. Two of the men who were part of the mass frenzy of sexual assaults recently received suspended sentences. Pictures show them cheering and celebrating outside of court. And most recently, reports of a rash of molestation and rapes at two music festivals in Sweden. The New York Times reports, the police said there had been five reports of rape and 12 reports of sexual molestation at the Bravala Festival in Norrköping, about 100 miles southwest of Stockholm, while 32 sexual assaults had been reported at Puti Parken, a music festival in Karlstad, about 190 miles west of Stockholm. We're gutted by these hideous reports, the British rock band Mumford & Sons, one of the headline acts at the Bravala Festival, said in a Facebook post. They continued, we won't play at this festival again until we've had assurances from the police and organizers that they're doing something to combat what appears to be a disgustingly high rate of reported sexual violence. Calver's warning has been echoed by numerous other prominent police, army, and security experts throughout Europe. Back in May, former MI6 head Richard Dearlove cautioned that Europe faces a populist uprising if its governments fail to take control of the migrant crisis. For the EU, however, to offer visa-free access to 75 million Turks 
to stem the flow of migrants across the Aegean seems perverse, like storing gasoline next to the fire we're trying to extinguish. Top security experts in Germany told Chancellor Angela Merkel last October that the middle class was becoming radicalized as a result of her open borders migrant policy and that domestic disorder could ensue as a result. French security forces are also preparing for mass civil unrest and radicalized immigrants taking over entire neighborhoods, according to intelligence sources. Last year, Swiss Army Chief Andre Blotman warned that the risk of social unrest in Europe was intensifying and that citizens should arm themselves. Zero Hedge reported the situation is growing increasingly risky, Blattman begins. The threat of terror is rising. Hybrid wars are being fought around the globe. The economic outlook is gloomy. And the resulting migration flows of displaced persons and refugees have assumed unforeseen dimensions. Danish professor Nyborg wrote in 2016, The current immigration policy gives us three alternatives. Submission repatriation or civil war unless europe starts to lead a responsible family immigration and integration policy stated by the theory of evolution i think civil war is most likely truly the will of the people is the only force that can drive back the social engineered invasion that common Europeans have come to gradually recognize for what it truly is, a hedra. Europe is under a growing hedra as it is known in the Muslim world. An Islamic conquest where Muslims overwhelm a country's population by flooding it with refugees. Nothing more, nothing less. John Baum for Infowars.com. Has Donald Trump picked his VP running mate? More and more the rumblings are that it's former General Michael T. Flynn. Michael T. Flynn has been a registered Democrat for most of his life. Uh, he seems to be pretty moderate on a lot of his policies. Is that smart for Donald Trump to do when if Donald Trump gets assassinated, then we would be uh, basically under the control of someone who leans more Democrat than he does Republican? I'm not trying to shoot down General Flynn. In fact, I've been a big supporter and fan of what he's done in his career, and I've followed a lot of his work. But I want to throw out one of the cons, one of the problems before we look at the good points. Now, let's go back to about a month ago. At that time, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama, who I think is a great guy, was at the top of the list. The problem is they're already pushing this racist narrative against Trump where he puts a star on one of his advertisements and they say it's anti-Semitic. I mean, it's getting crazy. And so they can obviously dig back into Republican politics in the 60s and 70s and the young Republicans uh, that Senator Sessions was part of and try to claim some racism angle. I personally say double down and who cares what the political correct are gonna do? They're always lying anyways. Uh, should he go for some Republican governor, woman, or senator? Uh, yeah, if they're a constitutionalist, they've got what it takes, they've got a good record. I'm all for having a woman VP. But it shouldn't just be a gimmick because it's a woman. They're talking about Hillary doing Elizabeth Warren for an all-woman ticket just because they're women. Again, that's a gimmick. I'm sick of it. But getting back to why I like Michael T. Flynn, he really reformed a lot of the work in special forces. He called for overseas spying, not domestic spying. He called for agency sharing information. He tried to really stick up for people in the military, but he also had more courage than anybody I've ever seen in modern times in the military. And then he came out last year on Al Jazeera and other platforms. And he said, look, Obama basically ordered us to help Al Qaeda, to help ISIS. And that's who we've been fighting on the side of for years. And the reporter said, oh, my God, so they didn't know. And he says, no, they knew and ordered that. He talked about the elephant in the room. In 2012, your agency was saying, quote, the Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood and Al Qaeda in Iraq are the major forces driving the insurgency in Syria. Mm -hmm. In 2012, the yeah. U.S. was helping coordinate arms transfers to those same groups. Why did you not stop that if you're worried about the rise of quote unquote yeah, Islamic I, I, I mean, I hate to say it's not my job, but that my job was to was to ensure that the that the accuracy of our intelligence that was being presented was was as good as it could be. And I will tell you, it, it goes before 2012. I mean, when we were when we were in Iraq and we still had decisions to be made before there was a decision to pull out of Iraq in 2011. 
I mean, it was very clear what we, what we were going to face. Well, just to clarify once more, you are basically saying that even in government at the time, you knew those groups were around, you saw this analysis, sure. and you were arguing against it. But who wasn't listening? I think the, I think the administration. So the administration turned a blind eye to your analysis? I don't know the if they turned a blind eye. I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. A willful decision to go support an insurgency that had Salafists, Al-Qaeda, well, and Muslim Brotherhood. A willful Brotherhood. decision to do what they're doing. Which, which you have to really, you have to really ask the president, what is it that he actually is doing with the with the uh, policy that is in place? Because it is very, very confusing. I'm sitting here today, Matty, and I don't, I can't tell you exactly what that is. And I've been at this for a long time. What Seymour Hersh has written about, what 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 we broke, what Colonel Schaefer has talked about, with what Steve Pachenik has talked about, he was the head of defense intelligence in the middle of all this, and here he is exposing it on international television that shows courage and if he'll expose the nexus point between criminal elements in our government bipartisan john mccain obama hillary arming radical jihadists to take over libya parts of syria iraq you name it and show that they're working with saudi arabia to betray this nation in europe he gets my support right there because he's also talking about the plan for a european caliphate he talked about the plans to flood us with migrants for destabilization. He basically got in trouble from Obama and taken out in 2014, despite the fact he was an innovator, despite the fact he was a Democrat, because he kept saying radical Islam, radical Islam. Well, orthodox Islam is radical Islam. He's not even going further enough saying that, but he got removed for saying radical Islam when it is Islam that is engaged in hundreds and hundreds of terror attacks and it's Sunni-based, funded by Saudi Arabia. So the word is, right now he's at the top of the list, and Trump could announce by Friday they're planning. The current word is, Trump changes his mind, obviously he's an innovative thinker himself, uh, that by Friday or Saturday they're going to be announcing the VP, and that right now Michael T. Flynn is right up there at the top. So is Jeff Sessions, but not at the very top anymore. He's still in the top three names. Michael T. Flynn. Don't forget what he said on Al Jazeera. Don't forget the article is also linked on Infowars.com because if we can show that our own government is financing Black Lives Matter and ISIS and Al Qaeda to destabilize the world and bring in more control, we can really reverse uh, a lot of the activities that the social engineers are involved with. I'm Alex Jones. Now back to Infowars Nightly News. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I'm Ashley Beckford with Infowars.com. I'm out here today on the streets of Austin, Texas to debunk the myth that cops are gung-ho about killing black men in the 21st century. Questions, please? Uh, you're busy right now? Okay, cool. Out of a thousand people killed in police shootings, how many do you think were black? Out of a thousand? Yeah. I know, 212. It's, well, go ahead. 212. No. <laughs> mm, that's a great question. Um, 400. 400? Yes. Out of a thousand, just any kind of shooting? Uh, this was police shootings in 2015. Police shootings, 2015, thousand people. Um, 700? I'll go 300. You'll go 300? 800. Okay. It's actually 258, but that was close enough. No, I, I just looked at the statistics. Okay. Does that surprise you since you kind of said, like, a higher number? Um, I think it is probably surprising, but at the same time, you have to look at, you know, media perception mm -hmm. of a lot of things that happen, you know, throughout the country. I think that the media skews a lot of different things. Um, you know, I am a senior at the University of Texas, but I am from Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just very interesting to see the difference in, you know, perception from place to place, from city to city. I don't know. It's not, like, given what I know about, like, the current, like, setup as far as, like, race culture goes in the mm -hmm. U.S., that makes sense. Just okay. given, like, how the demographics are, like, disenfranchised from historical pr perspective. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what the best mo motion, like, forward as far as, like, the political na nature would go. So I don't really know where to push for change, I guess. Yeah. And that's a huge uncertainty for me. Okay. And how about you? I think, you know, I did overshoot it a little bit with my estimate, but mm -hmm. the problem there remains that, you know, like this 
population that is out of the entire population, you know, 13%, like you said, mm -hmm. is being, like, killed in police shootings at a disproportionate rate, you know, like, obviously that is a problem we have to address, and we can't just be colorblind to it, you know, or blind to the problem. We have to say, like, something here is happening, and we have to say, you know, it probably has its roots in racism. But I guess my question is, with those statistics, how many were shot unfairly? Because a lot of times police can be, sh it, it can be a, um, a shooting, but under what circumstance are they comparing black shootings to white shootings? It's difficult to say anything really because there's so many uh, factors that play into it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, what was the main well, question? The, well <laughs> there's a cultural bias towards it because there's everyone likes to focus on racial inequities because that's just been like a kind of a recurring theme in America but mm -hmm. uh, I mean it still is disproportional I think in terms of population so there, I think there is an issue for sure that needs to be addressed but I think there are things that need to be done and I think that at the end of the day a lot of the times news sources and media love to you know put the blame on someone and to scapegoat onto you know police officers or something like that yeah. but at the end of the day, everyone makes mistakes. There's always instances of different, you know, violence and different crimes. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it's a shame that we're even having this discussion in like the 21st century. We talked to a lot of people out here about what they thought about the recent police shootings. And basically the bottom line is this. We have to educate the public about the reality of what's going on with these police shootings. Knowledge is power against the globalists. I'm Ashley Beckford with Infowars.com. There's been a lot of talk about the upcoming Olympics in Rio, and with all the issues out there, I wanted to go over some of the things that people are discussing. First of all, let's start with this. Uh, you guys may recall this about a month or so ago, officers saying, welcome to hell, as the people exited the planes and came into the city uh, doing their pre-Olympic trials, whatever they needed to do. And we see Rio de Janeiro has cut budgets across the board, delaying officers' salaries, halting patrols, and fueling worries about safety at the world premier sporting event. And the article goes on to document how emergency responders, your police officers, your firefighters have delayed salaries. They're telling them to bench their vehicles in an effort to save gas and all around just not providing the safest of environments. And it reminded me of the article we saw in Detroit a few years ago where police were telling people to enter the city at their own risk. They say this is a warlike type of situation and visitors are unsafe in the city of Detroit. At least they're warning people about this. They're saying uh, whether it's budget cuts or whatever else, they don't feel like they can do an adequate job of protecting you. But back to Rio, uh, the article points out that while the local officers are not being paid or having their salaries bent or whatever else, uh, the article reports that some 85,000 police and soldiers, roughly twice the security contingent, at the London Olympics are to be deployed. But it does point out that in a city of 12 million people where armed mugging, stray bullets and turf wars between heavily armed drug gains are routine, you still have a number of safety concerns. And as we're talking about Rio, there's a new article that's out today and it's documenting how a lot of times you have sex traffickers who try to uh, dovetail on these events, whether it's a Super Bowl or the Olympics or whatever else. And of course, I don't blame the sports organization. I'm saying people take advantage of those situations. Eight girls rescued from sex trafficking ring during pre-Olympic sweep in Rio. And to round things out, one of the things that I always thought was interesting is the Olympic venue, something that they build exclusively for the Olympics, but oftentimes these places end up derelict after the festivities have ended. And I have this article from the Business Insider, what abandoned Olympic venues from around the world look like today? And if you go through it, they have uh, many different pictures and things that you could look at. There are other articles out there as well, detailing that basically after everything was done, uh, said and done, the things said derelict and people brought the question, well, how good was it? How profitable was it for us to host the Olympics? Of course, you got, you know, tourism, you got people going to the restaurants and to the hotels and stuff like that. But to use money to build these big facilities and other things, especially in lieu of paying your first responders, like in the case in Rio de Janeiro, it has many people scratching their heads as to was it really worth it in the long term. Now, of course, I think the Olympics can be a great event. It uh, gives people a uh, sense of national pride, athleticism, people accomplishing their goals, all that warm and fuzzy stuff. But really, 
you have to wonder as well, was it really worth it at the end of the day? In some cases, I'm sure for, for some countries and some areas, it's a great financial boost. In other places, maybe not so much. You can find more reports on Infowars.com. Unfortunately, you've grown up hearing voices that incessantly warn of government as nothing more than some separate sinister entity that's at the root of all our problems. It's time to stop submitting to this tyranny. It's time to realize that we're being enslaved. Some of these same vo voices also do their best to gum up the works. They'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. Tyranny with a capital T. You should reject these voices. Everything that's been done with torture, rendition, the NDAA, the Patriot Acts 1 and 2, from day one was focused on the American people, period. That's it. It's always been about erasing the Bill of Rights and Constitution and rolling out NSA spying publicly, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, rolling out torture, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, but it's really for the general public, rolling out total control and the end of any underground free market systems in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda, but really shutting down any type of free commerce. This is all about converting us from a free society to a tyranny with a capital T. Joe Biggs here with Infowars.com. Now I want to talk about something that is weighing heavily on my heart, the direction our country is going in. And quite frankly, I, I'm getting pissed off, but the thing is, we have to understand, we're being socially engineered to be pissed off. For instance, today I turned on Twitter, and the hashtags I saw were Black Lives Matter, you know, all lives don't matter. All this racial division that is completely fanning the flames of this entire, what soon, what seems to be is a possible race war that's going to happen. Tensions are so hot and heavy right now in America, and everyone is so concerned about these damn labels. Black Lives Matter. Well, if black lives don't matter, then no lives matter. But if you say blue lives matter, that's racist. Well, guess what? Blue Lives Matter is talking about law enforcement, and those are people of all race, all colors, all gender, all religions, it doesn't matter. What we have is a huge systemic problem in our government right now. President Barack Obama, a black man, he was supposed to be the great equalizer, the uniter of our country. And since his time in office, there has been more division. We have an attorney general who's head of overall law enforcement in Loretta Lynch, she is a black woman. And yet people keep screaming for justice in the black community, and yet nothing's happening. But we see Black Lives Matter movements and people that are leaders in that movement coming out and calling for the killings of police officers to run them over and shoot them, to go after white people to target them. We saw what happened in Dallas this past weekend when multiple officers were shot and killed. That is ridiculous. We need to focus on unifying our country. And how do we do that? Stop labeling everything. Black lives matter. All lives matter. And I hear a lot of people keep coming out and going, well, if all lives matter, we wouldn't be in the situation that we are right now. And I can understand that. But what we need to focus on is the fact that we have a government, a group of elites who want to enslave us all. We are heading towards 1984, and no one sees that. We keep wanting to blame law enforcement. We keep wanting to blame other leaders or white people for the problems that are going on and completely ignore the fact that there are these global elites who want to enslave us all. And we have people like President Barack Obama, Al Sharpton calling for the federalization of our police departments. And this is what's going to happen when you have these Black Lives Matter movement leaders going out on the streets, on record, on film, being caught saying to go out and kill cops, what's going to happen? You're going to have all these local law enforcement officers who are either going to be too scared to go to work or they're just going to they're just going to quit. And then what's going to happen? We're going to call for this federalization of police and it's going to go into a militarized police state run by martial law.
And that's what people have to understand. Stop labeling everybody white or black and trying to blame it on a different race. We have a corrupt system that wants to enslave you, the African American, me, the white American, people of all races, colors, and genders. That's where you need to be pissed off at. Stop blaming police. Stop blaming other people for your problems. I've been stopped by police before. I've been harassed. Many of these people who have been harassed by police officers have done it for the 43 times. And that 43rd time, they end up getting shot and killed. Yes, that's horrible. Yes, that sucks. But let's focus on the people who are trying to bring us down. And that is the global elites who hate us. They want to have more power. When people get in power like that, what do they want? They want more money. They want more power. They want more land. They want more control. And they're using you as pawns to complete their mission. And I'm sick and tired of seeing everyone in America being played for as a fool. We need to all come together, people of all colors, races, genders, sexual orientations, it doesn't matter. Everyone's life matters. Everyone should have the ability to have that Second Amendment. Everyone should be able to walk down the street that has the ability to open carry without being harassed. There are black cops, there's white cops, there's female cops, male cops, it doesn't matter. We need to come together, stop using these racially divided hashtags to bring us down, and for once, let's unify and let's beat these people. I want to send this back to David Knight, who's hosting the news tonight. This has been Joe Biggs with Infowars.com. That's it for our news tonight. Thank you for watching, and we ask if you are not a supporter of Prison Planet TV, of the nightly news, that you would become a paid subscriber. Your subscription helps to support our operation and it gives you access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries as well as the news as it happens.